The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI, an official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Tonight's significant story will begin in just a moment. First, a brief word from the sponsor of This Is Your FBI, the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Here at the Equitable Society... We have been working for 86 years on one of the things that you yourself are most concerned about. Security for yourself and your loved ones. When we say you, we mean just that. You who are about to listen to this program. Even if you're not a member of the Equitable Society, you benefit indirectly through the stability that Equitable Society investments help bring to American industry and business. Get to know the Equitable Society Life Insurance representative in your community. You'll learn that it's a simple statement of exact fact that by serving Equitable Society members, he serves America. Tonight's FBI file, The Delinquent Parents. In America today, for every 23 persons, there is one with an arrest record. And the tide of crime is rising. The greatest number of arrests in all age groups is of boys and girls 17 years old. And the number is growing. Tonight's case from the juvenile files of your FBI is a drop of water in the rising tide. There is a popular fallacy that youthful law violators are most always products of poverty or underprivilege. If this were true, Abraham Lincoln might well have become the arch-criminal of his day. The truth is that they are, with rare exception, the products of parental neglect, a condition just as prevalent in homes of the well-to-do as in homes of the poor. Take, for example, the Medford home in a suburb of New York City. It is a few minutes before noon. Drake Medford, 16, comes out of his improvised chemical laboratory to make a request of his mother. Mom? Mom, would you mind if you... Not now, Drake. Can't you see I'm rushing? But, Mom, I just wanted to... Drake, I simply got to make the 1240. Bertha will be furious if I'm not there for the curtain. But I thought since you're going into New York... I won't have time to do any errands for you, Drake. It would only take you a minute, Mom, and I'm running low on nitric acid. Well, I... What? Nitric acid. Good heavens, do you want to blow me up? Nitric acid is perfectly harmless until combined with... Ah, well, I'm certainly not going to combine any with me. Okay. Whatever it is you're doing, Drake, it'll have to wait long enough for you to drive me to the station. All right. Be home for dinner? Oh, you know I'm never at home for dinner when I go to a matinee. Seems like you're hardly ever home for dinner. What, dear? Never mind. You'd better go back the car out. I'll be ready to go by that time. Uh, Ronnie's coming over after a while. May I use the car if we want to go somewhere? I don't care what you do, dear. Uh, say, by the way, Mom... Please, Drake, not now. Some other time. Some other time, some other time. It's always that way. Now, don't stand there mumbling. Go get the car out. But you never have any time for me. What? You said you never have time for anything concerning me. Why, Drake, the idea, how can you say such a thing? Never mind. Drake! Yes, you're sorry you ever had a son... And so am I sometimes. You're talking utter nonsense. You know perfectly... Heavens, look at the time. Okay, I'll go get the car. And please hurry, dear. Sure, you can't afford to miss the curtain. That's something really important. Drake! Come on, 
on in, Ronnie. I'm back in the lab. Okay. Anybody home? Nope. Well, how's it coming? It's all done. How much of the stuff did you make? That little bottle full. Hey, that's enough nitroglycerin to blow up the Croton Dam. Well, you asked me to make plenty. That's right. Hey, why do you want it? Drake, that stuff's going to get us something we both want awfully bad. What? That sailboat. The nitro? I don't get it. Look, we need 150 bucks, don't we? Yeah. And a fat chance we've got of getting it from our folks. They've turned us down three times already. I know. And we're going to go out and get it ourselves. How do you mean? Remember my Uncle Ben who lives in Connecticut? Yeah. He won't give you 150 bucks. He will, too, but he won't know it. How? Well, he and the family all have gone to Florida. But there's always money in his wall safe, and it'll be a cinch for us to blow it up. Blow up his wall safe? Sure, he's got tons of dough. He won't miss it. We'll even tell him someday who pulled the job, and he'll get a big laugh out of it. Oh, but it's not right. Look, it's in the family, isn't it? But even so... What's the matter, you scared? Oh, it's not that especially. Sure you are. You're scared your mother will find out. That's where you're wrong, Ronnie. Huh? She doesn't care what I do. And I don't either anymore. What's the matter? Have a fight? No. I'm just realizing where I stand around here. Well, I got wise to that in my house long ago. She lives her life, so from now on I'm going to live mine. Well, what are we waiting for? Nothing. We'll blow that safe tonight. I got the tools. You got the nitro? Yeah. Come on, let's get out of the car. Wait a minute. You're not getting cold feet, are you? No, no. I thought you said they'd all gone to Florida. What do you mean? That light upstairs. Oh, that's Waters. The butler. What'll we do? Oh, he won't know anything's going on until it's too late. How are we going to get in? They left the key with the folks. I slipped it out and had a copy made. Come on. Don't close it. Okay. Okay, here we are. I'll open the door. I'll go first with the flashlight. You follow me. The safe's in the library, just off to the left. Okay, there's the safe. That wall there. I'll drill a hole first. You get the nitro ready. Okay. Ronnie. What's the matter? Listen. Put out the flashlight, quick. Right. What'll we do? I'll take care of Waters. Hey, Ronnie, you don't mean you'll... Shh. He's turned on the living room light. Quiet and keep down. That's funny. I just sworn I had to... Oh. Hey, Ronnie, we better get out of here. Not until we get what we came for. <laughs> About an hour later, a telephone rang on the desk of Agent in Charge Durant of the New Haven office of the FBI. Durant speaking. This is police headquarters at Meadowbrook. Oh, hello. What's up? We think this is a case for the FBI. Oh? What happened? The wall safe in the Pomeroy house here was blown a while ago and the butler was slugged. Well, what's the FBI angle? They got only $50 in cash but took jewelry valued at over $5,000. We've reason to believe the thieves are from New York. Went back across the state line with the stuff. Well, that comes within our jurisdiction, all right. What do you want us to do? I'll start a special agent over to Meadowbrook right away to investigate. We'll be waiting for him. Right. Better take it easy, Drake. We don't want to get pinched for speeding now. Oh, I wish you hadn't taken that jewelry. What good's $50 going to do us? What good's the jewelry going to do us? Don't you know what the guys in the movies do with this stuff? Oh, you mean... Sure, hock it before it gets hot. Oh, where are you going to pawn it tonight? Oh, we can't tonight. But we'll be in a New York pawn shop with it first thing in the morning. Well, what are we going to do tonight? We're going to go home like nothing happened. Then you pick me up early in the morning and we'll head for a pawn shop. 
Look, Ronnie, I... Now, don't go getting nervous on me. You just sit tight and we're in clover. Back already, Tom? Yes. Pick up any leads? The butler is positive the robbers were very young, just kids. Oh? He started into the library to investigate the noise he heard, and had just caught a quick glimpse of one of them when the other one knocked him out. Oh, could he give you a description of the other one he saw? He didn't get that good look at him. Oh, how did they blow the safe? It was a nitro job. Hmm. The kids in nitro somehow or other don't quite go together, do they? No. How did they gain entrance to the house? <laughs> The easiest way possible. What? They had a key, apparently, opened the front door and walked right in. Well, what do you know about that? Guess you're thinking the same thing I am. Inside job? That's the way it struck me. Well, before we go to work on that, telephone the New York office and give them the details and the description of the missing jewelry. It's okay, Drake. Nobody in the shop but the pawnbroker himself. Come on. Look, wouldn't you rather I'd wait out here? Huh? What's the matter? You getting scared again? Oh, I thought he might be less suspicious if you went in by yourself. No, it's just the other way around. Come on. Okay. Well, good morning, boys. What can I do for you? Uh, we want to pawn something. That's my business. What have you got? Here you are. Well. What's the matter? Diamond bracelet? Pearl necklace? Where'd you get this? Well, uh, well, you see, it belongs to my sister. Oh? Uh, I mean, she didn't want to come here herself, and uh, she asked me to take care of it for her. Uh-huh. Uh, how much can we, uh, I mean, how much can she get for it? You wait a minute. I'll take them in back and examine them. Oh, well, okay, but we're in kind of a hurry. I'll be right back. Well, what did he have to go back there for? To examine it, like he said. Now, don't stop running it. Ronnie, listen. He's dialing a number. Yeah. Maybe he's calling the police. Let's get out of here. Wait a minute. You watch the front. Where are you going? I said watch the front. Um, just a minute, mister. Something wrong? Oh, we changed our minds. We want the jewelry back. You can't have it back. I think this jewelry's stolen. Give me that jewelry. No, you can't. Come on, Drake. What happened? Let's get out of here fast. While waiting for tonight's file to resume, as it will in just a moment... Here's a message of particular importance to you and your family from our sponsor, the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. This week at the Equitable Society, I heard a story of hope and courage about two young people who had everything that makes for success. Health, a home, and he had a good job, fine prospects for advancement, and a life insurance policy in the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. But then hard times struck, and the temptation came to surrender their life insurance policy. But somehow or other, they managed to keep it in force. And as a matter of fact, they are now, this week, about to retire in comfort on its proceeds. And that same dogged determination never to let a life insurance policy lapse is typical of more and more people. The figures prove it. Equitable society members are placing higher value on their life insurance than ever before paying premiums promptly, frequently paying them well in advance. Yes, your life insurance, in whatever company, we hope it's with the Equitable Society, is a valuable possession. Keep it in force, no matter what. And when you need advice, speak to your Equitable Society representative, who is trained to help you use life insurance to your best advantage. He wants you to be secure. He wants you to be safe. And he wants you to understand, as he does, that this week and every week for more than 86 years, the Equitable Society has been building security through life insurance for you, your home, and your country. And 
now back to the FBI file, The Delinquent Parent. We repeat, mothers and fathers of America, the greatest number of criminal arrests today in all age groups is of boys and girls 17 years old. And back of it all, with rare exception, is parental neglect. The parent who doesn't take time to understand, to guide, to make a companion of his boy or girl, may one day have to watch his child serve time. Mrs. Medford's attitude of utter indifference concerning her son, Drake, cannot now be far from a severe shock. The pawnbroker, struck down by Drake's companion, Ronnie, was taken by police to a New York hospital for treatment of his head wound. An official visitor enters his room. Mr. Adams, I'm agent in charge, Durant, of the New Haven office of the FBI. This is Special Agent Baker. How do you do? FBI, New Haven? Yes, we came to New York early this morning to follow up an investigation of a jewel robbery up in Meadowbrook last night. Oh? Uh-huh. When the police reported to our office here what took place in your shop a while ago, I thought there might be a connection. Uh, what can I tell you? What kind of jewelry were you offered? A diamond and emerald bracelet and a pearl necklace. That checks all right. And you told the police the jewels were offered by two boys? Yes, but they didn't look like criminals. They, they were so young and clean-looking. And... Could you describe them more fully? Uh, let me see. I'll try to be as accurate as you can, Mr. Adams. We have a theory that one of the boys was related to the family that was robbed, but we want to make certain before taking any steps. Uh, the one who did the talking, he was uh, 16 or 17. Uh-huh. He was a big boy... Like my son who plays football. And he's got red hair. That's what we wanted to find out. Yes. And now, Mr. Adams, if you'll give us a brief description of the other lad as quickly as you can, we'll be on our way. Stick to this highway, Drake. When we get up around Peekskill, I get another idea. Hey, what are you doing? I'm going to turn around. Turn around? What do you mean? We're going back. Are you crazy? No, that's why we're going back. I don't get you. We're going to go back and tell them we did it and get everything straightened out. Now I know you're crazy. That's the only right thing to do, Ronnie. That's the only thing that'll land us in the hooskow. Not if we confess. Look, Drake, uncle or no uncle, we blew his safe, stole money and jewelry, slugged the butler, and a while ago we slugged the pawnbroker. Maybe we even... Well, even what? Well, I hit that old man pretty hard, and I might have hit him too hard. You mean he's dead? Well, he could be. We can't afford to go back and maybe have a murder pinned on us. Murder? Yeah. We're wanted by the police now, but good. We didn't mean to go this far, but we did. And we're criminals now. And there's only one thing we can do about it. We can't go back home. We've got to go on. Don't you see? Where did you say to head for? Peachskill. Just a minute. Yes? Mrs. Medford? Yes? I'm Special Agent Baker of the FBI. FBI? That's right. May I come in? Well, of course. Thank you. I have only a minute. I'm dashing over to the club for a bridge luncheon. I really wanted to see your son, Drake. Drake? Yes. I, I don't believe he's here. Oh, Drake! There, you see, he isn't home. He went off somewhere in the car early this morning. Do you know where he went? Well, I don't believe he said. Have you any idea where he was last night? Good heavens, I'm afraid not. I never try to keep up with that boy. Obviously. I beg your pardon? Perhaps if you had kept up with Drake, Mrs. Medford, we shouldn't be trying to catch up with him now. What did you say? Ronnie's mother doesn't know where he is either. I was just there. I... I don't understand. Your son, Mrs. Medford, and Ronnie 
are wanted by the FBI. Can you understand that? Wanted by the FBI? Yes. Oh, no. There must be some mistake. Do you think so? I know so. How can you know that when you bothered to know so little else about your son? But, but I... At least I, you must have known that Drake has a little chemical lab in the house. Yes, I... But did I, you ever bother to know what he can mix in that lab? Well, no, I... One of I, the things he mixes is nitroglycerin. Nitroglycerin? Yes. Now, you'd better get a good grip on yourself for this, Mrs. Medford. What? Last night, Drake and Ronnie blew open the safe in the Pomeroy home. Oh. Stole money and over $5,000 worth of jewelry. Struck down the butler with a deadly weapon. Oh, no. And this morning, struck down an old pawnbroker who got suspicious when they tried to pawn the jewelry. Oh, it isn't true. It can't be true. Have you ever bothered yourself enough about your son to see that it couldn't be true? But Drake couldn't do such a thing. I'm sorry, Mrs. Medford. But because you haven't faced the fact of your responsibility to your son... You'll have to face now the fact that he's wanted in connection with three crimes. Oh, Drake. My poor, poor Drake. I'm afraid I'll have to put out an alarm right away. <laughs> May I have the license number and description of your car, please? <laughs> Thanks a lot, Sergeant. I'll get on it right away. Oh, Baker. Yes? Looks like we've gotten quick results from the alarm. Really? Yes, I've just talked to police headquarters at Peekskill. Yes? They found the Medford car abandoned down by the freight yard. I see. Well, it's pretty obvious what they did next. Exactly. We're on our way to Peekskill right now. I'm having them check all freight train schedules, and by the time we get there, we should be able to figure out where those youngsters are. <laughs> I wish this train would get moving again. I bet we've been parked on the siding two hours. What time is it, Drake? What? I say, what time is it? I don't know. I can't see my watch. Okay. It doesn't make any difference anyway. Ronnie? Yeah? I want to go home. Look, are you going to start that again? I've made up my mind this time, Ronnie. Sit down. You can do whatever you want to, but I'm going to get off this train right now and start back home. Are you coming with me? No, and you're not going either. Yes, I am. Wait a minute. Don't try to stop me. Look, if you haven't got any more sense than to go back, I've got to stop you for your own good. I don't care what they do to me. Suppose the pawnbroker is dead. I guess you want to go to the electric chair for murder. I didn't murder anybody. So you're going back and squeal on me and get yourself off. I didn't mean it that way. I mean I'm not really a criminal and you're not either. We just didn't stop to think what we were doing. But we did it. And I'm sorry for it, too. So are you and you know it. I want to go back home and get it off my conscience, and you ought to do it, too. You're just scared to be out on your own. You want to run home to your mother. What's wrong with that? You said yourself she didn't care anything about you. It doesn't make any difference. I care about her, and I can't do this. I'm getting off this train right now. Oh, no, you're Let not. Let go of me, Ronnie. No, you're That'll not. That'll do, boys. Huh? Well, who are you? We're special agents of the FBI. What? FBI? And I'm awfully glad we waited to overhear what you were saying, Drake. It'll make things easier for both of you. Yes, sir. And you were wrong about your mother. She does care. She cares an awful lot. So, come on home. Because of their extreme youth, Ronnie and Drake, after a full confession of their guilt, were given the opportunity of becoming good citizens in the future by being paroled. And now, an important message about tonight's case from Mr. J. Edgar Hoover, director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. A crime wave of growing proportions is upon us. It demands immediate attention on the part of every right-thinking American. Increasingly, it is becoming a youth problem. Last year, more youngsters 17 years of age were arrested than in any other age group. Now, here is a challenge for every right-thinking American. 
every community resource should be immediately mobilized, and every parent and adult should take their proper place in the fight against lawlessness. We have many splendid youth-serving agencies. Tonight, I want to single out one that has been tried and proven, the Boys Clubs of America. With over one quarter million members and 260 individual clubs, the Boys Clubs of America are celebrating their 40th anniversary. I have studied and seen the Boys Clubs at work. From these groups come thousands of law-abiding citizens who are an asset to their communities. By developing good citizens, they are preventing crime. This is Boys Clubs Week, and I would urge upon my listeners greater support of this worthwhile activity and the extension of the facilities of the Boys Clubs of America. Before we tell you about next week's thrilling case from the files of your FBI, a final important piece of information from our sponsor, the Equitable Life Assurance Society. To your FBI, you look for national security and to the Equitable Society for the financial security of life insurance. In the past 86 years, the Equitable Society has weathered four wars and seven major depressions. During that time, over five and one-half billion dollars have been paid to policyholders and beneficiaries. This power of strength, security, and stability is represented in your community by a man whom hundreds of your fellow citizens know as their good friend, the Equitable Society representative, who, like your FBI, is dedicated to the protection of you, your home, and your country. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Nylon Hijacker. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The role of J. Edgar Hoover was impersonated. However, all other names used are fictitious. And any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was under the direction of Frederick Steiner, the author was Frank Ferries, and your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Carl Frank speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Nylon Hijacker. On this is your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.